Praise the Lord, everybody. The Lord. We're so happy to be with you once again to worship our God together. Isn't it such a privilege? God, we welcome you here right now. We welcome you in this place, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your love surrounding us. Let the nation sing, let the people shout, lift up a shout of praise, hallelujah, let your kingdom come, let your kingdom pour come, your spirit out. pour your spirit out, that's all we want God, we want you to manifest, manifest, manifest your love, manifest your love, manifest, manifest your love. Let the nation sing, let the people shout. Hallelujah. Let your kingdom come, Lord. Let your kingdom Pour come. your spirit Pour out your like spirit never before. That's all we want is for you manifest. to manifest. manifest. Come on and manifest your love. Manifest. Manifest. Manifest your love. It's too high to climb, but it's available to us. Thank you, Lord. Time after time after time, God, your love is too deep, too deep to navigate, and it's too high for any of us to try to climb. But it's available to us. Thank you, Jesus. Time after time after time. Anybody glad about that? Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Here we go. Everywhere I look, your love is all around. Everywhere I look, your love is all around. Sing it with us, say. Everywhere I look, your love is all around. Everywhere I look, your love is all around. Sing it out, say. Everywhere I look, your love is all around. Everywhere I look, your love is all around. All around, all around, all around. Everywhere I look, everywhere I look, your love is all around. Say all around, all around, all around. Love is all around, all around, all around, all around, all around, everywhere we 
faultless stand before the throne. Father, stand. You alone, Lord of all. You alone, Lord of all. Sing that, sing that. You alone, Lord of all. Lord of all. Just lift up your worship. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone. Everybody, praise the Lord. Pastor Ashley here, and happy Sunday. Thank you to our worship team that has been leading us into the power and the presence of the Lord. We truly appreciate your ministry. Well, welcome. Welcome, Life Church. Welcome, family. Welcome, friends. And especially welcome to our visitors. We know there are many services you could have tuned into today, but we're so grateful that you've tuned into our service and we want to connect with you. So if you have not done so already, take a moment and subscribe to our YouTube page. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We look forward to connecting with you. Well, I want to take this moment to give a happy birthday shout out to our dear brother, Brandon Burton. Happy birthday, brother. His birthday was on Friday, and we just want to take a moment and say, Brandon, we love you. We thank God for you. We appreciate your life and your ministry and how much you are blessing us here at Life Church, and we know how much God is going to use you to bless the world. Brother, may God continue to bless you, and may God continue to increase you and your family. Life Church, let us flood him with our love and our celebratory appreciation. Happy birthday, brother. Well, we do have a few announcements for you guys today. If you have not joined us for a Bible study, you are missing some good word. You can take a moment and join us every Tuesday at 7 p.m. You can join us via our YouTube. Um, you can join us via our Facebook Live, or you can join us directly on our Zoom link as we continue to unpack and unfold the topic of prayer. That's right, the topic of prayer. So join us every Tuesday. Let's join the study and let's study the word of God together. And speaking of prayer, join us every Thursday at 7 p.m. via our Zoom link for our prayer time. It's so good to hear the saints of God coming together to pray and we're seeing how God is truly and humbly answering our prayers as we come before him. So come and join us Thursday at 7 p.m. as we seek God in prayer. And now it is offering time, time for us just to give a portion to God, what he has given to us, the numbers appearing on the screen for you to give to the Lord. Take a moment and give to God. And without further ado, it is now time for the word of God by our pastor, Pastor Benjamin Abdul Rahman. I do pray that this word will definitely minister to your heart as he continues to walk us through the book of James. Get your pen out, get your notepad ready, and let us go into the word of the Lord. Remember to join me afterwards for prayer and share. See you.
Good afternoon, Life Church. This is Pastor Ben here, and I am excited to be with you all uh, for this Sunday virtual worship experience. So grateful that you guys have decided to join us uh, for uh, this time in the Word. I'm very glad that uh, we are continuing in this series entitled Faith in Action as we look through the book of James. And I pray that you guys have been edified so far and you guys have been encouraged. I'm very grateful uh, that um, we are able to be challenged in the way we have been by the Apostle James. And I'm um, just given so many awesome uh, 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 gems and uh, great insights into what it really means to walk out this Christian life. So I'm going to pray and we're going to continue as we uh, dig into another concept, a concept I think really connects to the entirety of the book, uh, but I believe will also uh, give us uh, some some really, really important understanding uh, when it comes to what's going on on the inside as we seek to live out this faith in a way that others may observe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for another opportunity to dive into your text. God, I thank you for uh, the the privilege um, of being able to be called one of your own. And I just ask God that you would lead and guide my words, Father, that the uh, text would uh, become all the more clearer to all of the hearers, that they may walk according to your will, that they may seek your way, that they may uh, follow you in everything that they do, Lord God. I pray that if someone does not know you uh, truly, Lord, I pray you would open their eyes and that this sermon would be used for that purpose, that they would have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But I also ask God that for those who do know you, that they would be encouraged to continue running on, to share the good news of Jesus Christ to others, and also to be built up in their faith as they encounter so many different trials, God. Uh, Father, hide me behind your cross. Let your word take center stage and grab hold to the hearts of the hearers so that they would grow in maturity and that we would apply what is said in the text. We ask all these things and trust and believe in your power to do this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I, I, I want to uh, begin by uh, discussing a particular idiom or proverb. Uh, it's more modern um, that a lot of us have heard before. Have you ever heard the saying, uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too? You know, some of y'all just got hungry thinking about it right now. But yeah, yeah it, it's something that is communicated uh, and it is shared in our culture. I'm sure many of you have heard it before. And one thing that I thought about uh, as I examined the passage we'll be going over today was how much that particular proverb uh, really relates to what is said in James chapter 3 verses 13 through uh, 18. And also how much this idea of not being able to have two things that you may desire but are ultimately opposites or contradictory, uh, it, it just is a, a fact of life. You know, the older I get, I realize you really can't have your cake and eat it too, right? You, you can't be uh, rich and poor. You can't be a hard worker and uh, lazy. You, you, you have to choose one or the other because the two things are in conflict. They can't be at the same time. James, here in James chapter 3, is going to actually show us how uh, we can't be uh, people who subscribe or follow or utilize wisdom from above as well as wisdom from below, earthly, worldly, carnal wisdom. James lets us know in the passage we're going to look at that, listen, wisdom of heaven and wisdom of the world do not coincide. You have to choose one or the other. And he explains both of these kinds of wisdom, both of these kinds of understanding and let us know that they can't be together. That is either one or the other because they are opposites from one another. 
Let, let's consult the text. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And it reads in the English Standard Version. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual and demonic, earthly, unspiritual, demonic for the uh, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exists. There will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The wisdom that's from above, the wisdom of heaven, the wisdom of God versus the wisdom that's below. The wisdom of the earth, the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of sin. These are the two perspectives we're going to be discussing uh, this Sunday and next Sunday. And what I want to do is help us to really challenge ourselves to see if we are really utilizing the wisdom of God and how that's supposed to look in our lives. And also understand when we're utilizing the wisdom of the world, the wisdom that is below. Let's dive into the text. Verse 13 it says, who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Now here, James is just giving us a general picture, which is, I think is a general picture of the entire book. He's saying very simply, look, if you're wise, if you have wisdom, and he's talking about the wisdom that's from above, then whoever is supposed to have wisdom and understanding, the one that says they have the godly wisdom, the heavenly wisdom and understanding, they should have a life of good conducts and works that show up in the meekness of that wisdom. This is a thing that we've been seeing consistently in the book so far, right? Your faith should have works to go with it. If you have this godly wisdom, it should show up in how you act, in how you live. But that term, good conduct, is a very good anchor for understanding the wisdom that is of heaven, the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is always going to show up as good conduct. The wisdom of God is always going to show up as good conduct. Now, I want us to really unpack this idea of good conduct. This basically just means good behavior, okay? Good works, good actions. The reason I feel like we need to really unpack this is because, well, if we're honest, there are a lot of different definitions of good. There are a lot of different ideas today of good. When you say something is good, you can't assume that a person automatically understands what you mean by good. Today, good can be uh, examined or defined in many different lenses and perspectives. Some people define good based upon the body. So good will be defined uh, by their senses. So what looks good, what smells good, what uh, ultimately feels good, what tastes good is good. The problem with this, when we think about our senses, is our senses can deceive us. So sometimes what looks good, what tastes good, what seems good, what feels good can ultimately end up to uh, uh, be a, a part of our demise, something that is bad for us. Some of us have experienced that with food. Some of us have experienced that with relationships. Some of us have experienced that with different deals or partnerships or things that we've gotten ourselves involved in. At the end of the day, we know that sometimes our senses can fail us. So that idea sounds good, but it doesn't really check out. Some would define good according to others' experience. So, so here's what I mean by that. Your actions can be considered good as long as they don't hurt somebody, as long as they're not imposing upon somebody. Now, the two main objections to that idea is, well, people have different perspectives of hurt, so we can't really define that in technical terms, right? Like 
One person may think that you saying um, uh, what's up to them is disrespectful. It could be something that's hurtful. It could be something that they feel like, hey, that's not that's not showing that you respect me. Where you're in another environment, you say that and it's upbuilding to that person. People have different ways in which they interpret aggression or violence or hurt. And also when it comes to bodily harm, we have to recognize that hurt isn't always a matter of someone physically being hurt. You could say, well, it's good as long as someone's not physically hurt, as long as you're not killing somebody or you aren't hurting somebody in some way. Well, there are ways that you can hurt a person and not be bodily harm, right? Our senses can't be the final say on what is good. And other people's senses, other people's bodies can't be the final say either. The other thing that defines or can define goodness is society and culture. You know, the government says certain things are good. They're good. If the culture is generally accepting of a particular thing now or uh, encouraging something, that means it's good. This is problematic because we can just look at history and see several atrocities that have taken place, genocides and all sorts of things where it was decreed by law and it was accepted by culture. Yet, in retrospect, we would say it was wrong to do. It was not good. So what's the big problem with all of these perspectives about what is good? The common misconception and issue with the perspectives we have about what is good is ultimately they are defined by man. And this is what really gets us to the core issue between the wisdom of heaven and the wisdom of the world. Man ultimately has the final say among men. So, we end up being wrong about what good is. Now, if we consider who the standard is, who the one we should go to for what good is, then we'll have a proper understanding of what good conduct is. You know who we're going to, right? God. God is our standard. The scripture says in Psalm 25 verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. So we have to first understand that God is good. And because God is good, he's the one we go to about what is good concerning this world, this universe that he created. Second thing we need to keep, take into consideration. God is the creator of everything good. James told us this in James chapter one. James chapter one, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. God has made everything that is good. <laughs> Every good and perfect gift originates from him. He is good and he has made everything that is good and perfect. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepares every good work that is done before we do them. So he's the origin of good. He is good. He's the one who's created everything that is good. And even the works that we walk in that he's prepared beforehand that are good as well. Here's a bigger insight here, right? The first time good is mentioned in the scriptures, Genesis chapter one, verse three. They have a, 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 uh, 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 rule or law first mentioned that's supposed to be uh, helpful in understanding what a term means, especially when you look in the scriptures, right? Genesis chapter one, verse three. Okay. This is God. He's creating at this point, right? And it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from darkness. Okay. Here's what we see uh, broken down from this first appearance of the term good. God creates. God, with his word, creates light, right? He creates, and then he creates according to his will, and then he sees what he created, and him seeing that it is good 
It's not only him seeing that it's good. It's not only a matter of his perception that it is good, but it's also him decreeing that it's good too. It's God saying and making a judgment that it's good. This is what this shows us. This is what's amazing right here, right? Okay. God deems something good based on it having to be aligned with his will. Okay. This one, one quote here says it this way. What is in accordance with God's will is good in his sight. So how do we know what good is? How do we get an understanding of the, 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 the good concept? Well, uh, conduct. Listen, we know what good is because it has to be according to who? God's will and good in his sight. See, goodness is about God's perception and not ours. That's what I'm getting at. Goodness is about God's will and not ours. We've already talked about that a little bit, right? That's what matters most. And a lot of the time when we look at good in the scriptures or we think of good when we're in conversation, we miss thinking about what God says, thinking about what God sees, about God's perception. And we use our perception as the standard for what is good. And this is what leads to a lot of problems today. Because a lot of us are trying to live out a faith given to us by a good God according to our corrupt standards and perception. So we see good conduct in this text and we think, well, I'm generally good according to what? According to your assumption. But unless you're going through what God has said about what is good... You have to be careful about thinking you already know what good is when you see it in the scriptures. This helps us understand what this good conduct is. It is good as determined by God and as explained in the scriptures. It's good as God sees it, not as the culture sees it, not as our body sees it, not as others see it. As God sees it, James is saying here, look, if you say you have wisdom from heaven, if you say that you really wise, you have understanding, then you should be living and have works that coincide with what God says is good. That's what he's pointing at here. So we can't claim to have wisdom from above and not have Good conduct. Those things don't go together. And he takes it a step further because he breaks down how those good actions and good works are supposed to manifest, how they're supposed to show up. And this really throws us for a loop, man, because you're thinking about good works. And I know we imagine, OK, it's something that just everyone can see and it's just just out there and all the stuff. And, and that's true to a degree. But James kind of throws a monkey wrench in it a little bit here because he, he, he starts talking about this idea of meekness and wisdom. He says in verse 13, at the end of it, he says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So not only should good conduct follow wisdom that is above, wisdom that is heavenly, wisdom that is from God, but the way that it shows up is in humility. It's gentle. It's soft. It, it, it's supposed to show up in a way that is humble. That's how it's supposed to show up. Now, look, look, what, 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 what is it pointing to, right? What does that make us think about? Well, James knows, look, if we're saying, okay, well, wisdom from God is supposed to show up as good conduct. What is our flesh going to tempt us to do? Have a megaphone ready to let the whole world know of every good work that we're doing. So, so James is saying, hey, look, it's about good conduct, but it's about good conduct that is shown through humility in a gentle, soft and subtle way. Not in a way that has us just out here. Hey, I did something good. Uh, 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 look at me. I'm doing all this good stuff. That's not what the challenge is trying to push here. 
We have to be mindful of this. We have to be careful of that, right? Being someone who wants everyone to see our good works, but now it's not about glorifying God. Now, I know sometimes we hear this and I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm humble or we think that we start saying that type of stuff. But I just want to be clear. Humility is something that's observed <laughs> at the point that we start talking about our humility <laughs> or how humble we are. We cease to be humble. And James knows this. James is like, listen, good conduct should follow the wisdom of God and it should appear and it should be presented in humility. It should not puff up. Huh. God knew in his sovereignty, speaking through James, that we would be the type to take the good conduct statement, good behavior statement and say, oh, that means I need to just flex on everybody with goodness that I see in the scriptures, not knowing that the humility part is essential to how that's supposed to show up. Why does James break this down? It's because he wants us to really get the difference between wisdom that is from God, wisdom from above and wisdom that's below. He starts going into this because that that humble, that meekness portion has a lot to do with what we see in the wisdom of the world in the wisdom that's below in the wisdom of the earth and the carnal wisdom. Let's continue. Verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. Look at what's happening here. You have meekness and wisdom, which is a company or goes with good conduct. And James says, but here's the other side, the opposite of this. It's bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts. And he says, then do not boast. What? And it's also what? Boasting. It's boasting. And being false to the truth. That's a weird term. And we're going to break that down a little bit later. This is why humility has to come with the good conduct. Because it could just be an opportunity for pride and being puffed up. Let's think about wisdom below for a little bit. See how he shifts it. Wisdom that is below, wisdom of the world, wisdom of the earth has bitter jealousy at its heart. Bitter jealousy. What, what, what does that mean? It's the idea of eager rivalry or emulation. Emulation just means an effort to match or surpass a person or achievement, typically by imitation. So, so here, here's what bitter jealousy looks like here. It's the egotistical pursuit of outdoing somebody, of trying to one-up someone. You've observed what someone else has, what someone else is doing, and now your motivation is to outdo that person, is to one-up them. And it's connected to you imitating what they're doing. This is the wisdom that is below. Now, I know a lot of us, now we're not going to admit we're jealous, <laughs> right? Who, who's going to oh, I have a jealousy problem. No one's going to really just stand out here and say that they have an issue with jealousy. But trust me, these sins that James is talking about here, they creep up on you. And we're looking at others and observing what other people have going on. And something in us says, I want to beat them. I want to get to where they are. I want to surpass them. This is wisdom from below, and it's not the wisdom of God. Competition and rivalry. But how, how does this keep connecting to what James is talking about here? We'll, we'll, we'll get to it some more, but let's look at selfish ambition. The picture that shows up 
when you look at this term in the original language, right? Selfish ambition is actually the picture of a politician. It, it, it's the picture of, of, of somebody who's trying to get in office. Now, I'm not saying every politician is horrible or the worst in the world. So don't think this is a this is an argument against politicians. OK, right. Right. The, the, the passage is lending itself to a picture of a politician, but in particular, a greedy politician. One who is just purely trying to fuel their own ego. This is an idea or a picture of shameless self-promotion. This is the wisdom of the earth, right? The wisdom of the earth is I am campaigning. My life, my works are about campaigning for a position and status in culture and society in your mind. I want to be seen a certain way. So I have a campaign and everything I'm doing is so that I am built up. I am worshiped. I am glorified. I am satisfied. This is selfish ambition. Think about those two. Bitter jealousy, rivalry. So you, 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 you are basically a politician for your own interest, for yourself, campaigning for whatever you want. And looking at everyone else as your competition. I, I know it sounds wild, right? But we do that, don't we? Don't we slip into that way on our jobs, in our families, among friends? Oh, I'm so mad that they have that. And I want it. And we're pushing to try to get what they got. And it's the wrong motivation. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Now, now here's what here's what what is wild about this. And, and I want to I want to state something, too, before we even move forward. When I talk about selfish ambition, I know a lot of us get so scared because today we are really sensitive about talking about selfishness, because if we're honest, you know, the culture we live in and time we live in, a lot of times people will neglect themselves being a workaholic or you doing so much. You know, for others being a, a culture that's bent on people pleasing and things like that, we will miss doing for ourselves. There's a passage later on in uh, the, 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 the sermon where we're going to deal with that just a little bit. But I do want to be very clear. No one's saying you can't do things for yourself. OK, now I will say be careful if every time the idea of selfish ambition comes up, you have an argument right in the back of your mind, it's like, well, I got to do for myself. Okay, watch it, because that could just be you protecting an idol, right? But in general, God wants us to take care of ourselves. <laughs> he wants us to take care of ourselves. So self-care ain't bad, y'all. No one's saying that. But selfish ambition is. And selfish ambition will attach itself to self-care. <laughs> you got to watch out. That's what I'm saying. These are sneaky sins. So it's best to have a posture before the Lord, before the word to say, God, if that's in me, search it out. Just want to make that clear before we move on. Notice the shift in the text from what James does here in verse 14. How he ends this idea. He talks about bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, not boasting. And then what? Being False to the truth. Weird way of, of, of wording it, right? Do not boast and be false to the truth. What, what, is, what is James getting at here? What is he showing us and teaching us about wisdom that's below? The wisdom of the world. We get it. Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. We don't want that. But this is what's crazy about it. Because when we look at those two sins, it's very clear that those are bad. I made it also clear that it's Something that we all would struggle with in some way and it can creep up on us. But what, what is the real relationship to this whole idea of good conduct and who thinks that they're wise among you? Right. And, and meekness with wisdom. Like wh where is James really going and why is he using this weird phrase being false to the truth? Here, here's the key here. The picture that James is presenting of the one who has the wisdom of the earth, the wisdom of the world, 
get this, and this is this is very important for us to understand, is someone who presents a form of godliness, but internally has sinful motivations. See, we, we looked at the picture of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, and we thought of a person who's just outwardly uh, voracious in every opportunity and going after this and going after that and selfish and doesn't care about nobody. And we're like, OK, well, at least I'm out of this. But James's picture is someone who boasts and is false to the truth. This is what that term means. To be false to the truth is to say you are boasting of works. You are boasting of works that are good, but you're motivated by bitter jealousy and by selfish ambition. So you're being false about true wisdom. You're being false to what true wisdom is to the truth. We got we got to think about that now. James is letting us know what's going on inside of you. If you're boasting about every good work, that, that's really coming from a place where you are really in competition with everybody. You're, you're really just doing this for yourself. But it looks like on the outside, you're really about doing what God says and you're pointing it out that you are. But inside, this is, this is really a time to be transparent. The word is, is searching us in this type of text. And we got to be real. Are some of my works about being seen? And this is not just any types of works. Works that are religious. Works that are from the outside eye righteous. Works that could line up with God's word. But James is saying, look, the motivation can be off though. You need to check that. We need to check what's going on inside. Because when we have a presentation of these good works, but we're inwardly jealous and, and bitter and selfish, doing it for status or to be seen a particular way, we are being false concerning the truth, false concerning the wisdom of God, False concerning the picture of holiness. And, and look at this now. Look at this. Look at this. James goes really deep on us here. He lets us know what this really is. And why we need to take this serious. Because we can listen to this and say, yeah, but you know, I'm just going to go about it. It's too confusing to try to think through this. Look at what, how James raises the stakes. And he always does that, doesn't he? Verse 15. This is not wisdom that comes down from above. This is our main distinction that lets us know everything he's been talking about is wisdom that's below, not from above. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Sends chills down your spine. It's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. What? I don't know about you, but that just blew my mind. OK. You know, we'll discuss and we'll talk about Satan worship because that's demonic. Some occult stuff. That's demonic. And look, we should. It's, we should call the things that are wrong, wrong. Sexual morality. Man, that's that's some wickedness going on with that. You know, uh, uh, rich, oppressing people and just, you know, Throwing people out on the street, horrific atrocities we see all the time. That's that's evil. That's wicked. But how often do we know that when we have a jealous rivalry type of heart or a self-promotion mentality among the believers that that is demonic? That's demonic. That's evil. Think about what James was saying earlier in chapter three. When he was talking about the tongue, he said it's, it's set on fire by the fires of hell. He's saying, look, don't overlook this heart and that jealousy that is always oh, just a little thought. Oh, OK, I want it, but can't no one see that or the self promotion. Oh, I want to get to this place and I want people to see me. And you know what? 
I, I say this to you guys all the time. It may not even come out in a term. It may not even present itself as a phrase in your mind. You know how it works for me? I start picturing myself being praised by somebody, being lauded, getting a pat on the back, getting getting uh, 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 accolades for what I've done. I'm not going to fix my lips or even my mental mouth to say it, but I'll sure enough have a picture in my head. James is like, that's demonic. Think about why it is, though. It's perverting and distorting the image of godliness. Because it's the idea that as long as I have the outer things, I don't have to address the inward stuff, which is even worse because you are then masquerading and covering up as someone who submitted internally, spiritually to God. But your works really come from a worshiping of you and a worldly perspective. So you're really messing things up all the more. It's demonic. That's what James tells us. We got to take this serious. This wisdom that's below, this wisdom of the earth, that's how people work in the world around us. We all know it. People just chopping each other's heads off to get ahead. Promoting themselves. The greatest works of hospitality ultimately pointing back to how great of a philanthropist a person is or great of a humanitarian a person is. It, it just all keeps going back to self, 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 self. self. It's demonic. And we need to be so careful. And ask God to deliver us from it. From what's going on on the inside of us. Begging God remove a heart of bitter jealousy. And selfish ambition and promotion. Help me. We're going to get to some points on this. We're going to get some points so we can get some answers to how this works. But James has more. <laughs> but wait, there's more <laughs> for us to look. To look at. To examine. Verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vow practice. For where jealousy and self-ambition Exists. There will be disorder in every vile practice. Okay. Now, this is what James is saying. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition are a hotbed for vile practices and disorder. So, some of us are having a hard time trying to place whether or not we have selfish ambition or a bitter jealousy in our hearts, right? This idea of competitiveness, rivalry, also self-promotion, campaigning for status, wanting to be seen, wanting to be lauded, wanting to be applauded, wanting to be worshipped, if you will. Well, that's kind of extreme. I don't think I've ever had that, right? But I'll say this. The passage gives us a good detector of whether or not there is jealousy in our hearts or selfish ambition in our hearts. The disorder and the vile practices. Okay. See, we don't know the connection between some of the wicked things that we do or things that we do that we know that's that's out of whack. And we say, oh, well, where did that come from? James is giving us a key here. He's saying, look, it begins with jealousy and selfish ambition, self-promotion, wanting status. See, let's be real. We, we think that the drinking is about just, you know, wanting to chill out a little bit. The, the addiction, if you think that's about that. No, there's something we're trying to achieve. There's something we're trying to get from that process. We think the sexual morality is just a matter of, you know, us wanting to feel good for a moment, but there could be some rivalry in the heart that's making a breeding ground for the vile practices. We think some of the disorder and 
some of the things that we run, some of the things that we're trying to do, some of the things we're trying to handle, we're, we're overseers of. And they can run the list. It could be family. It could be your job. It could be an event, all that stuff. We think the disorder is because, you know, people just don't know how to work and do things my way and, and get it done right. But we don't get that. You know what? There's a selfish ambition in me that makes it sinful or, or, or gives way to sinful practices and how I deal with people. So now it's disorder. I have a jealous heart and it's showing up because everything's in disarray because I'm engaging out of that disposition. It's not always just going to be you see the jealousy in your heart and you accept it or you see the selfish promotion and the selfish ambition because look, we're all having to do things for ourselves. We can see what someone else is doing and see when they're further along than us. So how do we know the degree to which it's going too far? James is letting us know, listen, every vile practice, disorder, it lets you know, you know what? There's something, there might be something going on in my heart. Bitter jealousy may be there. Selfish ambition may be there. And when we start noticing the actual actions and seeing what the root problem is, then we can start addressing what's going on inside and then order can come. Then righteous practices can come. Now, now this idea of vile practices is a very interesting term because it's the picture of an egregious, horrific sin that can be done easily. Something really bad that can be done easily. And, and I'm going to tell you how it shows up in my life, right? When I can uh, be argumentative or have an angry spurt very easily, something's wrong. Something's wrong. When we can jump into certain acts or, or things that are against God, practices against God, and we're like, why, did, why am I even going there? We need to start saying, what's going on in here? Is there a competitive or rivalry mentality I have going on as I'm, as I'm going about my day and my life that's building up a sinful disposition? Is, is there a, a selfish promotion that I'm, that I'm formulating here? Because the practices are not what? Good conduct. <laughs> James is helping us out here. He is helping us out. Now, next week, we're going to go deeper into good conduct as we close out the verse. But I want us to consider some things as we look at the wisdom that's below. As we look at this bitter jealousy, this selfish ambition. And we think to ourselves, what are we supposed to do with that part? Some of us right now, I know I got it in me. Pastor Ben, it's been said enough. I see it. I see where my perception of good was wrong, where there is a rivalry mentality, this idea of outdoing other self-promotion. There's something in me that just wants more and more and more and more. What do I do? Well, his was beautiful. And we talked about it before in some other sermons, right? This idea of the wisdom of God, the wisdom that is above is wrapped up in Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the wisdom of God. And as we look at Jesus being the wisdom of God, we'll understand how Jesus being the wisdom of God is actually the opposite of the wisdom below. Of the bitter jealousy and the selfish ambition. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 through 24. I mean, verse 20 through 24. I think this is an NIV. It says, where is the wise person? Very interesting. Starts off a little bit like James did. James and James uh, 3, 13. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of the world, of, of, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. 
Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Think about this for a second. The wisdom of God, the wisdom of heaven is always going to go against the wisdom of the world. James explains the wisdom of the world as being a, a heart of bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, boastful and false to the truth. Think about Christ crucified. Jesus is a picture, an example of selflessness. He is a picture and example of complete humility, of putting others before himself, not being in rivalry and competition with others. By dying on the cross. This is why Jesus is the wisdom of God and the wisdom of God is the opposite of the wisdom of the world. The gospel that saved us, that brought us into right relationship with God, screams humility, screams selflessness. So how can we be saved by a selfless Messiah who died on the cross for our sins? Not in competition, not in rivalry. How can we be saved by this gospel and not display Selflessness to others. Not put others before us. We have to look to Jesus. We sit back and we hear stuff like this and we're like, well, what am I supposed to do? Look to the Lord and also know that you're looking to the Lord to spawn works that is doing for others. Considering others. Well, Pastor Ben, you, you can consider others but still be doing it for selfish reasons. Let me tell you something. Your consideration of others and your doing for others, and I've experienced, and I'm sure many of you had, is going to push you beyond your selfish promotion. Trust me. If, if you're really trying to consider someone else and do for someone else, you're not going to be able to keep it up for too long. It's an act that breaks the will because at a certain point, you feel like, hey, I'm doing too much, but... Look at what Christ did for you. <laughs> now, we know that I can go into dicey places and I'm not doing a whole sermon, a whole side speech about that. But there is a humility that is birthed from considering someone else for from doing something for someone else. And I think the key to being maintained and right in your motivations while you're doing that is looking at Jesus. See, the other side of this, the rivalry side, the self-promotion side, it comes from not having your focus on the right person, the right one. You looking at other people, not looking at Jesus. Philippians chapter two, verse five. Says, do nothing from selfish ambition. I'm sorry, not verse five, verse three through eight. Philippians chapter two, verse three through eight. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We can be selfless. We can have the mind of Christ. And Paul in Philippians chapter uh, two lets us know that that looks like considering others, putting others before you, not doing things out of conceit and selfish ambition. Well, how do I focus in on that? How do I do that? Look at Jesus. 
Because looking at Christ while you're doing these things is humbling. Because Christ, the God-man, humbled himself. Even to obedience to the cross. That is the opposite of the wisdom of the world. And look, we are going to be challenged in that area because that is against what is deeply etched in our flesh and in the world around us. Now, note what he says, Paul says in Philippians chapter three, okay? He says here, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Okay, let's just be clear about this, right? Helping the point. No one's saying you can't do self-care because Paul says, look not only to your own interests. He doesn't say the fact that you look to your own interests is bad. No, no, no. But you should also look to others. You should seek others to help, to walk with, to serve. A lot of our issue is we don't even prioritize or look for opportunities to help someone else. And that's evidence we're not looking at Christ. We're following the blueprint of the world. Of the wisdom of the world. Do for others while looking to Jesus. And that'll cut right at that bitter jealousy and that self-promotion. Christ will humble us as we look to him because that's the perfect example of the wisdom of God and he is our enabler to be able to walk with good conduct and not only good works but also a good heart to go with it thank you God ask him to work that out in you to birth in you a heart that is free from fighting and rivalry and competition and selfish ambition so that you can with freedom walk out this faith and not have to worry about disorder and vile practices following you because the heart's not right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for your spirit. Lord, I ask that you would grant understanding to each and every one of us and also strength. So God, we would come to you humbly asking, you would search our hearts, Lord God. You would search our hearts and our minds for those spaces and those places we give room to because we think these sins aren't that bad. We think selfish ambition and self-promotion is so closely attached to just having confidence and being a, a, a person who is, who is, who is forward-moving and thinking and innovative. But Lord, remind us it's demonic. Show us where it's producing vile works and practices and disorder in our lives and disarray. God, help us to see the jealousy in our hearts as we look at our friends, as we look at our family, as we look at our acquaintances, Lord God, and get us to a point where we look at you and say, Lord, I don't want to participate in those practices. I want to walk out the wisdom that is from above. Help us, Lord. Help us to walk this thing out, Father God, and to be transparent and even if we don't know what's going on in our heart, help us to lay before you and say, Father, search me and show me the error in my ways. Lead us to repentance and confession, Lord God, and to turning away from these ways as we look to you. And we seek to be selfless and humble that your name would be glorified. That should be our motivation, not competition, but your will being done. We love you and we thank you because we know you've heard us and you'll guide and lead us through this. Help us to live according to the wisdom that's from above, the wisdom that's found in Christ Jesus. Let's go all these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
All right, guys, I will hopefully see you guys in prayer and share uh, after service. Pastor Ashley is going to give a presentation here and um, share the gospel with you all. I love you. I'm very, very, very glad uh, to be your pastor. And um, we will be definitely communicating with you guys about um, some future steps and plans and things like that uh, coming along the pike. So stay tuned for all of that. But I pray you guys are able to uh, really walk this out and be encouraged by the word of God as you consider what's going on in the inside as uh, you seek to walk out the wisdom that is from above. Love you all, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Well, I know this word has definitely been encouraging and convicting to your heart. And if you're listening to this message, my friend, and you have not made a decision to accept the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, my friend, wisdom for you is to call on the name of the Lord and to be saved. For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that through him that the world might be saved. And there's only one way for us to stand right before the Lord, and that is to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, to acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ was fully God, that he was fully man, that he died on the cross for our sins, for our debt, and that he raised from the dead, that God raised him from the dead. And as we place our hope in him, then we shall be saved. How? How do I commit to the Lord? How do I be saved? By believing in him, believing in the Son, and turning away from your sin. Right? That's what he desires for us. And my friend, the wisdom of the Lord is for you to believe in Jesus and turn away from your sin. And so let me pray for you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that who has heard this message and that you are pricking into their heart to come into fellowship and relationship with you. I pray God in the name of Jesus that they will understand and know Jesus, understanding that he is the son of the living God, that he is Lord, that they will submit to his lordship, that you'll give them the grace to believe you, to trust you, to have faith in God and to turn away from their sin. Father God, save my brother, save my sister, Lord God, in the name of Jesus and draw their hearts closer to you, Father God, Lord, in fellowship and relationship with you. May they connect to a Bible-believing church where they can grow in their faith and in their relationship with God and continue to grow in you. Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask all these things to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.